I have become convinced that we as a people, humans, uh, we love to hate. I am convinced that we love to hate. Um, and go with me on this for a moment, because I know that you're all loving, gracious, kind, beautiful people who would never say a bad word about anyone. Um, but politics, maybe. Um, and maybe, I don't know, some of you get a little hot under the collar about your sports teams. Yeah, you get a little riled up, yelling at one another. Um, sometimes fist fights break out about these things. Um, I grew up um, when Ohio State would have a victory or a loss, and it didn't matter because um, people would take to the street and burn couches. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and I kind of feel like that's a very visceral emotion to want to burn your couch. Um, I really like my couch. My couch is my friend. But um, anyway, I do believe that we love to hate. Um, we're drawn to hate, actually. Psychologists have looked at this um, because, one, it can feel good. Like, there's just something powerful about it, like that gut reaction and how it kind of stirs up anger in us at times, um, but also it reinforces those tribal connections we have. And I'm not just talking about like historically as we've you know been tribal people, but even nowadays we are still very tribal. If you don't believe me, go to a high school. Um, people group up. We group up. Um, and we do this um, because in our past, and I think sometimes even today, our tribe and being aligned with our tribe, our group, meant survival. Meant that, oh, we are one together against everybody else. And if you weren't connected in the tribe, if you were pushed out of the tribe, it could mean death. And again, going back to high school, because some of us are still there, even though we're 48, um, we live in that world of just, man, if I don't have people even just to sit at lunch with, I am, I am socially dead. And so I think when we look at this, we want to maintain those tribal allegiances, and we often do that by pointing to the other. We are good, they are not. And we share this hate together. We share this anger, we share this animosity, and it can be very kind of intoxicating because then we get all righteous in our anger because we have the right answer, don't we? We are the ones who are right. We want to be right. So everybody else must be wrong. And if they're wrong, they don't deserve to be part of our group. And I think this is sometimes really challenging for us as Christ followers because we are called to a different way. We are called to swim upstream a lot of times in our culture um, because it's really easy to get divisive. It's really easy to pick a side because if you, you feel like if you don't pick a side, they're going to pick a side for you, which is outside, outside the group, outside safety, outside anything. And I know that a lot of us are probably not in a situation where we're like, ooh, I need people to actually you know, survive day to day you know, physically. I have shelter, I have food, I have a job. But we are relational beings. And if we do not have community connection, something inside of us dies. Something inside of us often goes wrong because our creator created us for relationship. Created us for relationship with him and with one another. And so as Christ followers, we need to embrace a different way. Not the way of hate, but the way of love. And we've been looking these last few weeks at how Jesus welcomed in those who had been pushed outside. And he says, come on in. My kingdom is different. My kingdom says all are welcome. And see, Jesus welcomed those who their culture had ignored and discarded. Um, we talked last week about how Jesus welcomed children who would have just been ignored um, that they weren't considered very valuable. But Jesus said, bring them to me. Bring, me. bring me the kids with their dirt and their boogers. Bring them. And so he also talked about how the vulnerable people had a place in his kingdom. 
that we should be on the lookout for them in order to welcome them in because it was so easy to overlook them. Well, then he takes it even a step further because he calls us then to even go to the place of welcoming those that you hate. And some of you may have a nemesis in your life, or you may not. Um, I don't know that a lot of us operate that way, but I will argue that you have people that you greatly dislike, if not hate, in this world, even if you don't know them. You know, who do you treat poorly sometimes because of what or who they represent? Is it people in authority? Do you have this animosity towards police officers or even teachers or politicians because of an experience you've had. You have this gut reaction to it because sometimes of an experience, but I would argue that then you have this kind of oppositional approach to people. Is it someone from a different class than you? We all love to pick on the rich, right? Because none of us consider ourselves rich. You know, eat the rich, eat the wealthy. They, you know, poor baby, oh, you're wealthy, it must suck to be you. And yet, at the end of the day, they too are made in the image of God. How about criminals? How about people who have served time or committed a particular crime that you find awful or repugnant? And maybe they have served their sentence. They have endured the punishment that we as a society legally have imposed on them, but then we love to compound that punishment because we don't want them living near us. We don't want them working with us. We don't want them around us in general. We want to push them back away, push them back outside. If you have a record, God forbid you want to get a job. We make it difficult for them. And this is the problem because we then, you know, we, we make this straw man of like, well, they did something wrong. They have to be treated accordingly. There are consequences for your behavior. I'm not arguing that there aren't consequences for your behavior. Doesn't mean that their actions are acceptable. Doesn't mean that you have to affirm their actions. But they are acceptable as a human being. They are acceptable because they are created by God. They are made in the image of God as you and I are. And today we're going to dig into a passage from, Math, um, from Luke's gospel. This whole week I've been like mixing these two up, so just bear with me. It is Luke's gospel. I am correct on this right now. But we are digging into a passage from Luke's gospel. It is in chapter 5. It is verses 27 to 32. And it's looking at a man named Levi, whom we also call Matthew, who was a tax collector. And we're kind of like, okay, he worked like for the IRS. Nah, it didn't work like that. Um, yes, he collected money from people and gave it to people in the government. Um, but this was a profession, and I know that we're not very fond of, you know, tax professionals in general, um, the IRS. But this profession was despised by the Jewish community because they viewed them as collaborators with the enemy. See, we always have to remember that 2,000 years ago, the place that we think of as Israel was a very different place. And that there were people living there who were oppressed by the Roman Empire. The nation that we know from bib biblical information as Israel was oppressed, was under the boot of the Roman Empire. And so tax collectors who were Jews were viewed as, oh my gosh, you picked the wrong side. And so the Jewish community would often treat them poorly. They would be hostile towards them. They would view them as corrupt, as turning against your own people. And they were stereotyped and treated poorly. Now, we sometimes do this with people in their professions. You know, Some of you may have particular opinions about lawyers or used car salesmen, politicians. They're an easy target, aren't they? especially these days and the season that we are in. You know, we even attribute to people in the news, they must be the Antichrist. Have you really thought about, like, that label against somebody? Like, you really must not like them. You must really want to tear them down because you are demonizing them. 
you are dehumanizing them, I would even say. We use the term demonize somebody, but in reality, we are taking away their humanity so that we can feel more comfortable about saying nasty things about them. We would never probably say it to someone's face. Or maybe we would if you're that ballsy. But we sure feel comfortable in the safety of our own homes or on the internet, tearing people apart, dehumanizing them, demonizing them. And this is what they would have done to somebody like Levi. They demonized him because they viewed him as the enemy, that he was taking advantage of them and others. And that doesn't mean his actions were justifiable. Doesn't mean his actions were acceptable. Doesn't mean he was a good guy, but he is acceptable as a human being. And his role made him this social outcast. He would have been shunned by religious and other leaders in their community. He would have been considered even ritually unclean, which meant he could not have gone into the temple area. And so think about this life. You know, we think about the IRS sometimes. We're not that excited. You know, my husband and I are having this argument with the IRS right now, and we're not big fans of them. But they are largely anonymous to us, aren't they, and faceless. I don't walk into the grocery store and go, oh, man, that's that tax guy. I really don't like him. No, they are faceless to us. We don't have to interact with them, really. But Levi would have been very much in the community, experiencing the shunning, the hostility daily. And despite this, when Jesus encounters Levi, he saw the potential in him. He saw the humanity in him. And he saw something that no one else saw. He saw his potential to be called a disciple. And Jesus calls Levi as a disciple. And he takes it even a step further and invites himself to dinner with Levi. So allow me to read a few verses for us today. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Levi captures the essence of what it is to just let go of everything in order to follow Jesus. This man who everybody in his community looked at as sinful, as awful, as just demonized him, Jesus sees the humanity in him as well as the potential to be a disciple. And he will take it that step further by having a meal with him, as well as all of his riffraff friends. After this, Jesus went out and saw, sorry, I'm still there. <laughs> Jesus sees him, he calls to him, and I love that immediate response, but even more so is for us to understand Levi's value that Jesus saw not in the value of what he could do for Jesus, not in the value of his work product or his resume or what he brought to the table. He saw that innate worth that we are all given by God and that cannot be taken from us because anything given by God cannot be taken from us. It doesn't mean that others won't treat us poorly or that we won't treat ourselves as less than worthy. But God has determined our worth. God has said we are worthy of love. And he declares that not only are we worthy of love, but we are loved. And Jesus sees that value in Levi and invites him into ministry. And he goes public with this. Now remember, in this community, people knew each other. They knew each other's business. So when Jesus goes to dinner with Levi, he is publicly declaring his acceptance of Levi, which would have been just outrageous. And he has a meal at Levi's house, not only with Levi, but all the other problem children in their community. All the other people that they were like, oh, you do not know, you don't sit at their lunch table. And at this banquet that is happening, um, hosted at Levi's house. 
we see this banquet and a large crowd of tax collectors, again, who's going to associate with people who are outcasts? Other outcasts. And others were eating with them, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Basically saying, your rabbi, he doesn't get it. These are not the people you associate with. And we don't get this sometimes because we don't put as much weight on this in these situations. But table fellowship, this is what this is called. It was actually an exclusive practice. It was meant to signify to everybody who belonged and who didn't. So when you had a meal with somebody, you were showing them that you accepted them, that you were standing with them in solidarity, that you were going to back them in social situations. And only those who were deemed worthy or part of the same like social, religious, political group would have hung out together. Again, reinforcing the tribe, reinforcing who is in, who is out, who is other, who is us. And this is kind of, we do this a little bit in our world, you know, kind of a big corporate dinner where only, you know, the big mucky mucks are invited and you got to pay $5,000 for a plate and then to be able to shake someone's hand and get a picture with them. This is an option of the elite. This is a prestigious thing. Not everybody is invited. Those low-level workers, mm, maybe you can be part of the catering team, but you're not sitting at this table. That is what this would have been similar to us. It would have reinforced all those divisions in their society, as they do for us today. Only those who are in this circle get to circulate with one another, and only these people get the opportunity to have that interview. Only these people have the opportunity to go to this school because they are known. They only want to hire people they know or somebody knows them in their circle. So Jesus does this radical thing where he not only says hi to Levi, he goes to his house, he has dinner with him and his riffraff friends, and he shows the entire community how much he accepts Levi, how much Jesus has said, I see something of value in this man that none of you have ever seen. And this radical acceptance is Jesus' very mission because his response to the Pharisees, Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, righteousness, that being right with God, being in alignment with God, being in God's tribe, the beautiful thing is that God's tribe has no divisions. All are welcome. All are invited in. All have a seat at the table. He has come to call those who have been pushed outside, the sinners. He has called them, turn back to me. He's not worried about your pedigree. He's not worried about your worthiness to come to the table. He doesn't care who you know. He doesn't care who you don't know. And the thing is, we, we forget this. See, once we're in, we kind of go, ah, yeah, of course, this is, this is who I am. But we forget that none of us, not a single one in this room, is worthy to sit at the table, and yet we are invited. We are invited to sit with God in that way, even though we are not worthy. We do not get there on own merit. You see, I'm standing up here with the microphone, right? So I should be worthy to have this spot. I'm not. Because this morning, I got angry with my children, which Jesus draws a line of is the same as killing. Hmm. Did you know I was a killer? Mostly just spiders. But I do. I, I usually, every Sunday morning, it's a practice of mine. I get up, I take a shower, I yell at my kids. Maybe sometimes I yell at the dog. So I'm not worthy, but I am called. I am not worthy, but I am called. That is my credential, and it comes from God. Levi was called. The call makes him worthy. The call makes me worthy. The call makes you 
worthy. And we live in a world that loves to say, if you're worthy or you're not, are you worth this? What value do you have? What do you bring to the table? How hard can you work? How many hours can you put in? What kind of house do you have? What kind of job do you have? Because those things will make you worthy in our world. What kind of activities are your kids in? Oh, you're just on the rec team. My kid's on the travel team. We're going to Cincinnati this weekend, and then we have to make a detour through Atlanta. Yeah, I'm really a big fan of travel ball. Um, but we put all these things on people. We, we judge them in, out. Are we on the same team or not? Let's figure this out. When it's all crap and ridiculous because God says, none of you are worthy, and yet I love you all, and I've given you all value because you are created in my image. Everything you have of any value, I have given you. So no one can take that away from you. Only I have the power to take that from you, and I choose not to. In fact, I choose to make a way for you to come home every single time. But we love to push people to the margins because that makes us feel safe. Because if they're out, that means I'm in. And then we love to do this next thing. We love to help them. I'm going to help people because I'm in a better position than them. The homeless, oh, I'm going to go feed them. I'm not going to sit down and have a meal and talk to them, but I will throw things in a plate and give it to them and smile at them and say, God loves you, but I just can't be bothered to sit with you and have an awkward conversation. Am I lying? We love to be at a distance from people, even when we say we are trying to love them. No, you, you are trying to prove to yourself that you're worth something. Sit down with them. Have a meal. Treat them like you're all on the same playing field because you are. Immigrants, refugees, these are other people we love to say, oh, you've know, you got to earn your way in. But we don't even treat them like they're human. People with disabilities encounter this regularly because we send very clear physical signs that you are not welcome, either with the way you can get in or you can't get into the building, or once you, if you are in, maybe you do not have a physical disability, but once you're in, if you act weird, ooh, we're gonna give you that look. We're gonna move our chair a little further away from you. Don't you dare, dare make me feel uncomfortable. And we love to say that in our society that we are fully integrated, we have you know, embraced the civil rights movement, and we are there, we are good. Mm, yeah, we all love to listen to Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I have a dream. And yet, just this week, someone was telling, about, telling me about an organization that they are a part of that does not want to open their applications to the general population for a scholarship because God forbid, you can't tell who's brown these days just by their name. We don't want any of that. <coughs> it's 2024. That's ridiculous. So don't tell me that we are done with any of this. Because we are still sinful, selfish people who are trying to keep others out so that we can preserve what we have. And that's not to say I don't have work to do myself. Oh, I have a whole laundry list of crap I got to work on, y'all. I love to demonize some people. I love to come home and talk to my husband about all the people I am angry with. And I have a whole routine for him. I think I'm really funny when I go into this shtick. And, and he, you know, he listens and nods his head, and then he starts to offer perspectives, and I just don't want to hear it. Just agree with me. There's something so satisfying on picking on people that we don't like or agree with. Or if they have the wrong bumper sticker on their car when they're driving too slow down the road, and we have to look at the stupid bumper sticker as well as have to drive behind them when they're really slow. So it just compounds it. Like, they must be an awful person ahead of me. I got work to do with the Holy Spirit. We all do. 
Because spiritual maturity is not how much we know or who we know. Well, yes, it's part of that. It's knowing God. It's knowing Christ. But it's not rubbing elbows with the pastor or spiritual celebrities. Spiritual maturity is the quickness with which you respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual maturity is the quickness with which you respond to the prompting, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's when you know, I need to offer an apology. What's the lag time in that? Where is our place that maybe you need to humble yourself so that others get the glory? Because it doesn't matter if you get the glory because you have the glory of God with you. It doesn't matter how many verses you can quote from Scripture or how quickly you can do it or your perfect attendance at church. I love to see you all. I love to see you. I love to talk to you. But your attendance here doesn't get you more Jesus points. It is how you treat people, your compassion, your kindness, that which overflows not from performance, but this funny thing in Christianity that we call perfection that has nothing to do with psychological perfection and everything to do with being perfect in love, being perfected in love, getting better at loving, loving God, loving others. That is the measuring stick, y'all. And so to do this a lot of times, to be those people who are willing to be self-aware, to know where we fall short in order to welcome others in, to be attentive to the Spirit at work at us and cooperate with the Spirit. Now, where am I going with this? Okay, Levi is this demonized individual in their community, and yet Jesus welcomes him in and reaffirms his humanity. He humanizes him again in their eyes. And this is what we need to do continually with other people. We have talked about being bridge builders. We've talked about what it is to build a bridge, that you have to come from two different sides, that you have to be willing to sometimes bend. You have to be willing to accept where people are, accept their basic humanity, because we all have it. And this merger has forced me to recognize my own preferences. As we've talked about, oh, how should things be done, I find out, like, oh, no, this is the way it's done. This is the way you do it. No, it's not. It's the way I do it. It's not the best way. It's my way. And I keep finding myself holding tightly to things that are merely my preference. They are important to maybe how I have expressed my faith, how I have grown in my faith, how I, I, not all. And I really need to let go of some of those things so they can hold more firmly to Christ. All the other things are negotiable. Christ is the non-negotiable. Jesus' call to me is to love God and love others. And the thing is, love, we get wrapped up in, oh, love's a feeling. Mm -mm, love's an action. Love isn't about how you feel about somebody so much as how you respond, react, treat them. Are you treating them in a loving fashion? Love demands us being vulnerable. Embrace the awkward. Embrace the uncomfortable. Embrace letting go of that armor that you like to wear, that merit that you think earns you a spot at the table when in reality it doesn't mean anything at that table with God because God says, I earned that ticket for you. We want to have genuine connections with people. And as we enter into this space with new folks, as we live our lives every day, I want us to think, how can I meet people where they are? How can I look for those that society has pushed out in order to make a way for them to come back in? I want us to serve in ways that are risky, that are, make us uncomfortable because we are growing. We are growing in love. And we, like I said before, we often like to hold those who we are serving at a distance. We like to feel that we are better than them, and that is, distance is what helps us with that. But the thing is, 
Better shoes don't make you a better person. Nothing adds more value to your worth in God's eyes. God cannot love you anymore because he loves you fully and completely. God already determined your worth. God already determined your worth, and it's the cross. God already determined the worth of the person that you are trying to help or maybe the person that you are trying to demonize or dehumanize, it is the cross. We love to quote John 3.16, but we miss the critical word in that passage, in that verse. For God so loved the world, the world, the whole stinking thing with all the stinky people and their boogers and their dirt and their issues and their dysfunction. God loves them all. And that's why he sent Jesus for our salvation, to save us from ourselves. And we're all worth that cost because God says so. It's humbling. It puts us all on the same level. But that is how we become builders of bridges, that we are willing to be on the same level with people. We are willing to listen and give somebody the same amount of attention, even if we disagree with them, because they are important. Even if we don't appreciate their position, we can appreciate them. We need to listen to others and not get defensive. We need to be willing to learn about ourselves through others' eyes. We had an individual come to this church years ago and I remember seeing her, and I welcomed her, and I talked to her. And I saw her later on in the week. And she said, your church isn't very welcoming. Your church isn't very friendly. You say it's friendly, but it's not. And I looked at her and I said, but I talked to you. We had a conversation. These are the things we talked about. How would you not feel you were acknowledged, that you were received, that I made it clear that I was happy that you were there? She said, no one else talked to me. It's your job. So, folks, I am the Walmart greeter of Church in the Mall as well as its pastor. But I had to hear that. I make a joke now, but I had to really hear it and realize, like, yeah, that would feel like disconnecting if you are looking to integrate into the full community. If the only one that talks to you is the person whose job it is to talk to you, right? We need to listen and learn to grow. We be the church that God has called us to be, to be a church that accepts people because they are accepted by God, accept their personhood, not their political beliefs or their views on parenting. This is how we not only welcome people into an actual like space, a building, but we also welcome them into our very lives, that we sit down at that meal table with them, we mirror Jesus' example. See, last week, we talked about what it is to be received by Jesus like a child, but also how we enter into the kingdom of God like a child. With trust, humility, that we are open and receptive, that we are even joyful in this. We don't need to be the frozen chosen, y'all, because we're not. We are invited into God's kingdom much like children come. We come with nothing of value except what God has already given us. So my question for us today is who? Who do you despise because of who they represent or what they represent? In the last few months, I have seen lots of celebrations regarding certain outcomes in trials. It's been fascinating. And if you're somebody who did celebrate something coming out or not or turning out the way you wanted it to do, I don't care if you celebrated so-and-so or if you celebrated so-and-so. I don't care. I really don't. But I do care if you acted like the person on the other side of that celebration, the one who is not celebrating, if you treated them like your enemy because they're not. 
We fight battles not against flesh and blood. We fight battles not against flesh and blood. We fight them against the forces of evil in this world. Not a person, not persons, not people, but against the own selfishness and sinfulness that exists in this world. That is what we are called to fight against. That is the enemy. You picked the wrong team to fight. If you are looking across that battlefield and you see another person, let's not treat each other the way that the first century community would have treated Levi. He was treated with hostility and disdain. He was disregarded. He was demonized. He was dehumanized regularly. Let's not do that. Let us embrace the way of Jesus, the way of welcome and love, treating everyone that we encounter with worth and dignity because this is how bridges are built. Amen.